everyone and welcome. This is Melissa with the StockSwoosh.com and I'm here this evening with Trader Jen. Welcome Jen, how are you? Great, how are you this evening? I'm wonderful. You know, Jen, I gotta tell you, you have the funniest, funniest name in the room. Do you wanna tell everyone what your name is in the room? Zen. Now, where did you come up with that name? I don't know, it just came to me. <laughs> well, I thought you were into yoga or something, you told me. That's right. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of that. And just, I'm kind of mellow. Well, the interesting thing is, so everyone knows, Jen used to work at the Chicago Exchange. Is that correct? At the Merck, yes. And then I worked at Smith Barney. Wow. Interesting. And I forget, how many years now have we known each other? Three. Wow. So you actually found me at the beginning of the time when I started teaching. Correct. I was, um, I don't know exactly. I don't remember what I was looking for. I was just looking for classes. I was looking for something that would have someone else other than myself that I could feel like I bounced off of energy or ideas. And we, right. we met. Right. And then after that, I mean, we started talking. And the basic gist of it was that you right now currently, I mean, you have people... You know, you're big time. I mean, you have people that manage your money, but you said to yourself, like, I got to get into managing this myself a little bit, or tell me how that transition really happened for you. I, um, I just feel like really, unless there's an extreme problem, all of us are capable of doing what money managers do. Mm -hmm. um, they don't always do that much. <laughs> and, and it's expensive. I really, I had money managers on my family's accounts because mm -hmm. I honestly just worried if something ever happened to me, um, you know, who would they turn to for any advice? Okay. And that's how that happened. But I'm moving past that. Mm -hmm. And so that's... I mean, you have a lot of conviction in your own abilities, and that's the thing that I think would really assist you in being able to, you know, trade, basically. We've talked about this before. I mean, I think you have a lot of self-confidence and, and your businesses and your dealings and the things that you do. The one thing that I want to talk to Jen about, and the reason I wanted to talk tonight was, number one, to talk about Lulu. But Lulu, I'm going to talk about as an example. Jen has taken my bearish gap class. But the thing is that Jen really, really loves longs. And when we were talking, I'm trying to work through everything with this with Jen. Jen admitted to me only a few weeks ago that she actually prefers to go long than short. So tell me a little bit about that, Jen. I have no good reason. I've always <laughs> been a more bullish person. And I've always, I've just always been a buyer more than a, a shorting. I've shorted before, I mean, okay. of course, but it's just for some reason, strangely, it's not a comfort zone to me. I can't really explain it to anyone. Maybe there's something about it that feels a little bit backward to me, mm -hmm. or um, I think that's it, really. I just think it's almost like a right-left thing. So, so wait a minute. So you, I know you've been core long Apple since like the beginning of time. Do you right. think it's that you've made all your money going long? Do you think maybe that's what it is, really? Well, sure. That's my. Oh my God! What happened? Uh, what happened? Okay, we're back. I'm back. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, I have made. I've always made the most of my money going long, even when I was a stockbroker. Um, just as to my style, I guess. I think we all have a natural style. Okay. I think shorting is more natural for you, maybe. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely natural for me. But the concept of going long gaps, obviously, is something that you're capable of doing. You saw the Lulu today. We talked about the Lulu last night. The interesting thing about Lulu is when I woke up in the morning, I saw Lulu was barely gapping up. It was like a smidgen. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to bother with this thing. It was around 62.50 or something like that. Right before the open, it actually had a huge, massive push-off at approximately 9.15.
and it ended up gapping up and, and really opening at a very, very different price than it was in the morning, and I never went back and looked at it. I mean, what time did you actually look at this? I know you ended up texting me. What time did you go back and look at the Lulu? Because you said to me, oh, my Lanta, this, this ran like umpteen points. Well, really, let me think a minute. I think I got up at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. and I was just, I would just turn on CNBC with no volume. I was just watching the, the ticker. And um, I want to say it was down mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at 5. And then I think I, I looked at it around 1.30. Mm-hmm. You'd have, I don't know. I'd have to look and see when I sent you that text. But it was up five over five dollars. Yeah, here it was. Here's about six o'clock in the morning. So here was around where you got up, and this is where I looked at it too. You know, I get up early as well, and then I said, "Oh, this is a piece of crap. I'm not going to do anything with this today. It's not going to go anywhere." But I should have went back at it because look at where it went from sixty-two all the way up to sixty-six. It actually in fifteen minutes and twenty minutes it rallied up four dollars. I could have actually gone long this today, and as you know, I don't like to go long. But I will tell you that Lulu was a good bullish gap today and was a good long. Now, let me ask you this. Did you go long Lulu today in your account? No, I didn't because it did not seem like it was going to go long at all. It was going to be a long trade. I really didn't know which way it was going to end up going. And I went to my office. I got sidetracked Mm -hmm. um, with a client. And when I looked at my, my ticker, I was like, oh, I missed it. Yeah, exactly. Now, what's the one what's the one major 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 thing you've learned in reference to from my class about gaps? If you could pick one thing. I know you've done the class a couple of times. What's the one thing that you think has really helped you? Well, I think for me, I I I'm very systematic and you have a system. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a discipline. And I think it just reinforces habits I've already had, but you go in, in much, actually, you go in much greater detail mm-hmm. when you explore a stock than I really ever did. I'll be honest. Mean, you mean you, even <laughs> back in the day when you used to like manage people's money and you never ever went into that kind of detail? Like back in the, you know, back in the day, you didn't, when you were, you know, managing people's money, you did it? Well, you you know you have to think when you manage big big amounts of money. What are you talking about? That big amounts of money? Like, give me an example. Because I honestly, I never was a stockbroker. I never did what you did. I never worked on the floor. I never did anything you did. So tell me, like, give me an example. Typically, when you deal with millions of dollars, um, and you know you have to think, I might be your portfolio, your I might be your manager, okay. your uh, your broker, whatever you wanted to call me. Right. But it's impossible the way the market moves, really, to be able to have as many clients as I had and to be able to go in all day long and trade. It's just, it's not possible to have. You mean because you had so many clients? Is that what you're saying? Right. So, you know, often what you do is you then end up working with, you actually do work with money managers. Right. And they're set up, let's, let's say you bring me a million dollars. Right. And then you, we, you know, pretty much just determine your risk tolerance. And then I'm not a, a huge fan of mutual funds, mm-hmm. but um, what I did was I would work with managers that did actual stock positions. Okay. And, and there may be shorts in the account. There were obviously more long positions than short. Right. There was hedging. There was, you know, depending on how, which manager I worked with. Um, you can combine different styles. You know, I might have had uh, 250000 in a large area of, of growth or mm-hmm. whatever, and then I might have had small cap stocks doing something else. Or, I mean, obviously, the way that a portfolio is constructed, it's not like it's just, you know, in four equal pieces so you now, know you're saying when you were hedging so you were doing like options against like some of the equity positions is that what you're talking about yeah they okay. would you know they would do protective you know positions right okay. depending on what the market's doing if if it was if they felt like it was necessary okay so so now so then what ended up happening that you got out of that like it was a crazy crazy time i know when you were you were involved in that business 
and you had given told me some stories about that like what ended up making you get out of it like you obviously never lost conviction in the market how did you get to back to the place where you got out of that being a stockbroker and then you came back and decided you wanted to get back into the market like what was the transition in your life from there to there that you I mean you never lost really conviction in the market did you or you just were tired of being a stockbroker what happened I it was a it was a lot of things my my dad wasn't very well his health was declining and I had to basically go back and start taking care of my family's business okay and so I decided to um you know I just I watched we hired an outside broker because I didn't have access to the resources I had when I was at Smith Barney and my dad did fairly well in life with money Okay. And we needed, I wanted more um, mm -hmm. access and I, I had a lot going on with our business in general, not, it was more than just his assets. So we had another guy that I, I basically monitored, work with, talked to, mm -hmm. asked him, you know, things that tried to put him on the spot sometimes, really. Um, <laughs> and... You know, I did that until my dad died, and then I took everything back over uh -huh. and put it with a friend of mine for a while at Smith Barney. And then I decided I didn't like Smith Barney's fees for, for what went on, really. And mm -hmm. I watched things for, like, efficiency and taxes. Um, right. You know, did they clean up at the end of the year where they had gains and losses the right way? Mm -hmm. um, things like that. And I ended up going to Schwab. Okay. And that's how, that's where I am now, so. So, I mean, as far as your personal trading, though, like, do you feel that with what you learned about gaps, that you could take this and run with it? Or is something holding you back? Is it is it holding you back because I focus so much on the shorts that you're, that you're afraid to short? Are you thinking that you really need to be focusing more on the longs or... What is where? What is what is missing with the piece for you to just go at this? Because I know that you have the discipline. Of all the people that I've met, I know that you wouldn't be careless with your money because you're so careful with everything. You're so conservative compared to most people that I have met, even though you have a very vivacious personality, which is an interesting combination. So what do you think it is? I mean, when you said this a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know what? What is it that is making you think you really – are holding yourself back from doing this thing like full on I I don't really have a good excuse I, I do think that the shorting does distract me I'm also distracted with my real estate business okay but more more I think it is me just if I would commit to this mm -hmm. for one month right and be in the room at least four days out of the week I believe I could get my mindset in line with the shorting mm -hmm. to be as comfortable with that as I am with going long. Okay. I think it's just a it's just a me thing with money. It's just a back it seems backward to me. <laughs> so when you were doing the money managing, when you were stockbroking, you're saying you really were not doing that many shorts. Is that what you're talking about? No. No, it was mostly long positions always. I mean if there was any shorting it was in a portfolio that a money manager was doing. Now, was this back in the heyday when, like, all the tech stocks were, like, bursting like crazy and everything was along? Is that why, do you think? I was a broker when the NASDAQ finally hit 5,000 in March of, was it 99? Wow. And then watched that go tumbling down. I was still a broker 9-11. <laughs> watched wow. the market rally off of that. Okay. And then watch the market plummet in July of the following year, July of 12. Okay. Watch the market really pretty much bottom out. Now, Come back again. That makes sense. Bottom out again in 2000. Um, what? Started in 2007, acted crazy through eight. And right. then in nine, okay. started to climb back again. And here we are. You know, we're coming. We're in another cycle. So. Now, let me ask you this like Michael Kors were you in the room the day that Michael Kors got down were you yes I was okay would you <laughs> have shorted Michael Kors I mean can you see this with everything that I taught you like this stock literally fell off the planet the high of the day was 50 50 and the low of the day is 45 88 
I mean, this stock ran down almost five dollars on the day. And if you had if you had bought this, you would have lost. If you had shorted this, you would have made money. Do you see in that the panic, the kind of panic activity where there's money to be made? And again, this isn't holding it overnight. This is just doing the day trade. I'm thinking to myself as I'm trying to help you that with your with your background, you're used to taking something and buying it. It's a buy and hold mentality that you've been doing. The shorts, you could use to day trade. And the longs, you could take with the market, with the market rallying with a bullish market and hold the stocks that are strong and short for the day trades if you want to. Or go long like Lulu if you wanted to today. But I'm saying to help you, maybe like something like this, like you do the cores, you do the cores for the short on the day. You make money on the day, you get out. You're flat by four o'clock. You're not used to doing that as a stockbroker, but now you're in a different position in life. You're like a day trader. You could do it. Oh, I, I could totally do this. I mean, it's just a matter of here I am. It's funny you mentioned Michael Kors. I was in my office and I looked, I was talking to this woman and <laughs> she had a Michael Kors bag hanging on her shoulder and I was like, oh, I still can't believe I didn't take that trade. Are you serious? You really yes, regretted totally it. I'm serious. Oh my Lanta. So you were there. You regretted not taking it. Yes, I did. So what do you think in your mind going back? It was only like two weeks ago. Like what were you thinking? You were thinking, did you not have conviction? It was a short or you just have the concept of shorting that is like in your mind, you're like shorting, I can't make money or what do you mean? I was actually emailing with my attorney that morning mm -hmm. and and I was at my desk and I was emailing because I did not want him to call and charge me for leaving me a message <laughs> and, I missed, and I missed a trade. I was like, you know, it's like, I should have taken that $150, $200 phone message and made the trade. I would have made a lot more money. It was my fault. That's, That's the honest truth. That's I, hilarious. It is. It's like everyone knows I'm up really early. So a lot of people start, you know, getting a hold of me at like five or six in the morning when I work out or whatever. So it's kind right. of funny. Now let's go here and look at the market. Again, you, as you know, I've been talking, talking, talking about the fact that I have 100% conviction the market's higher and will make a new high this year. I just kind of want to get your take on this based on what I've taught you about gaps. And I know you haven't taken the bullish gap class yet. But you have taken the bearish gap class, and the market did gap down today, but as you see, it rallied and bounced into the close. Do you feel that the market's higher? What is your take on this from your experience in reading charts? Um, in the queues, <laughs> the spot. Could you, could you repeat that, please? <laughs> Sorry. I was saying, do you think the market's higher or not? Do you agree with me the market's higher, or do you think the market's oh. lower? No, I think the market's higher. I mean, you're in core, core, core long positions. Are you concerned about those long positions? No. Because of the positions or because you think the market's higher? I just think we're still running. I mean, let's wait for what happens with interest rates. I think what we're doing right now is pricing a lot of things in that might really rock the market. They talk about it so much when it finally happens. If they, if they hike rates, whatever, it right. won't be that big of a big of a deal to the market by the time they do it. That's usually what the way they do it, you know? So, so. why now, do you really more focus on reading financial reports and investment news, or do you focus more on technical analysis? Like, what do you focus more on with your background? With my background, I've always had a technical, you know, more of a technical mind, but mm -hmm. in when I was in, in the market, I was more involved with, watching the numbers and and even that was the way it all started when I was on the trading floor and I was a clerk in the end mm -hmm. the numbers when I say watch the numbers it's like what financial numbers come out is it housing is it right GDP whatever um, that was a big momentum maker you know it always has been probably always will be right. farm payrolls non-farm payrolls I mean you know People, I think people get emotional, and I'm not sure they completely know what's going on, but you got to love them. <laughs> now, let me tell you, I mean, like, I know you've told me some stories, just tell everybody here. Like, back in the day when you were doing this stuff, like, I remember you telling me stories, like, weren't you on the floor and, like, people were crazy. Like, I watched that movie. Gosh, I... I mean, I'm so naive to this stuff because obviously I've only ever electronically traded. I've never been a stockbroker. I've never been on the floor of the exchange, even though I live in Manhattan. 
And you were on the floor of the exchange at one point, and I had watched that movie, Wolf of Wall Street, and I called you. I remember after the movie, and I said, this seems completely unrealistic. And you were like, no, 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 Melissa. You know, this is 100% realistic. I mean, when you look back at the things that you used to be involved with, and then you think of yourself today, like, what's the, what have you learned from that experience? Like, tell somebody one of the crazy stories of the craziest stories that have ever happened to you or things that you've seen that people have done like that make you really just say oh my gosh I don't even know why I'm involved with this thing except for the fact that the money is so powerful um I was a clerk in the yen and I did not trade my own account I was young mm -hmm. and I um I was on the trading floor when traders didn't use I believe it's called Globex that they use now on the, on the floors. It's a little handheld computer. In the day, my day on the floor, would they use trading cards that you would write your long, you know, you would write on the front or back of the card. That would mean you were either long or short okay. a position. That's hilarious that compared to with the way thing that I do now today. I mean, I literally press a button and I'm in. I mean, that's hilarious to me. Oh, no. And, and it was like the clerk was the person that kept the count for the trader. So I would have to make sure the back and the front of the card basically matched, if you will. Because what if they you screwed have you? An open position. What if they screwed you, though? They did. That's I was what I'm on the talking about. When yeah. the FBI came on the trading floor. Why? Why did they come on the trading floor? I'm lost. Because traders in. I can't mention names. I can still see some of those guys on TV in Chicago, um, in the pits, or I have in the past. I haven't watched for a while, but um, S&P, Swiss franc, Japanese yen, about four or five of the guys that stood around me that were actually traders, not clerks, right. ended up being convicted of stealing. They could steal. It was easy. There was no way to monitor what really happened yeah, yeah. before or after. They manipulated the market because there was no way to track it. And so obviously now there's a lot of improvements to that. I mean, obviously now you trade your own thing. I mean, there's rules or regulations. I mean, don't you think right now is like a great time? I mean, you can do your own thing now and you're protected, don't you think? Yes, but back then you could make a lot of money on the side, apparently. <laughs> really? um, you know, it you're worked funny. for a while for some of those guys. It was interesting. It was, it was a fun time. I probably would never say I wanted to go back and do it again. But it was a great experience. Didn't you say that at one point, I think you were telling me you worked for your boss and your boss would leave like Thursday or Friday or whatever to go golfing or whatever he would do. And he would be like high as a kite on coke or uh, something. And you would be, have to like take his trades or manage his accounts. Like, didn't you tell me that at one point? I would just, no, I would just hang out in his office and, and try to figure out if he left any loose ends and then try to find him on a golf course on the cell phone. Crazy. The big cell phone. That was the day of the big Motorola. Wow. Um, like in Wall Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making fun of that phone. Um, but so, um, yes. So now, was interesting. where do you think you're at with your own experience with trading from the time that you started out with all this experience to get to the point to meet me now? Like, where do you... Where do you see yourself a year from now? Like a year from now, would you think you would actually short Michael Kors? Do you think you're going to actually start to get the conviction to do this? Like if, in a year from now, 2016, June 2016, where do you see yourself with your trading? Oh, I'll be I'll be trading three to four days a week next year. Okay. I will. And I'll be shorting. I, there, there's actually no reason that I can't short. It's just I know how to do it. It's not hard. It's it, it's really just like being long. It's the exact same thing, except for I mean, you're flipping you just it. sell. There's yeah. no excuse. It's just my mindset. I've always been a buy and hold long person. That's mm -hmm. just me. I don't know why. But the one thing I want to say is if you're really, really good at doing one directional bias, which you're good at seeing things to the upside, all you have to do then is be good at things, seeing things to the downside. Like I always tell people, get good at one thing. If you can get good at going long, then you get good at going short. First, get good at one thing. You're good at going long. Now you can get good at going short. It's the same thing with me. Like, I first got good at going short, and then I was able to get good at going long, and that's the way I'm able to see the market is higher. 
But I think it just is about becoming really, really good at one thing, but you've done that. It's just that you haven't taken the leap into the next area, which is getting good at going short. You know, when you're shorting a stock, even if it's temporary in the day, it doesn't mean that you're like giving up in the company or something like that. I know you watch all these television programs and I know you like to read some of the things about the earnings reports. Just because you short something on the day doesn't mean you're giving up on the company or the retailer or anything. It just means that for that temporary period, you're making money on the day. I really have nothing against making money, whichever direction I have to do it. <laughs> I, I, um, you've just changed my mind completely. I uh, can't be in the room tomorrow for very long, much time because I have a meeting at 10. But, okay. Or right. I have a meeting on Thursday at 10. But on Friday, <laughs> I can be in the room. Wonderful. Fabulous. So I really, really am glad that we had this conversation. I'm going to do everything possible to try to help turn you around from going long to short and realizing that you can do both. I know that you understand everything that I taught you because I know that you're very intelligent. And I know that you have more experience than I do with the stock market, which is why it's so interesting that you have this thing in your mind about going long. But I, I congratulate you for recognizing that it has been a hindrance for you and that fact that you're able to be in touch with yourself to actually know it is going to help you move forward. I think that that's the biggest thing at making money. If everyone can just not act like they, they know they know things or they feel good about everything, you'll make a lot more money if you're just real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the way I look at it. I don't yeah. care to say, wow, I, I just don't feel good about this. And that's or, the conviction. But that's the conviction. Do you understand? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I will say that that's one thing you're really, really good at. Like, you had 100% conviction in Apple. Let me just look at this. And I said to myself, this is going to fall off the planet. Now, they did do the stock split. And I think that changed the stock price and dramatically. But, I mean, when you hold the conviction, it helps you take risk or stay with the trade to a dream target or get out of it. Now, just quickly, well, one last thing here. Let's look at Apple. In an ideal world, where would you like to see Apple go before the end of 2015? I, I feel like Apple will probably hit somewhere between, and I know this is a little bit of a wide range, but, but it ahead. is Apple, and go we ahead. know Apple does do wide swings. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we're going to hit... 150 to 175. Yeah. I don't, I think I will love Carl Icahn if he's right. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and Apple hits 240, but I don't see it. Well, I'm just talking about this calendar year. Right now it's June. I think 150 is a realistic target. I, in my mind, I was thinking 160, 165 for the dream target for Apple for the end of 2015. So where it's kind of right at basically about what I taught you with the targets. Mm hmm. Right. It's that's about I think that's the correct range. I'm not sure what Carl Icahn's 240 price is unless he's lowered it and I missed that recently, but I think that's a little high. Now, but how much weight do you pay to those things? Like when you hear them? How much what? How much weight do you give those things when you hear them? I just go, that's right. Oh, that's wrong. I just <laughs> I can tell a bluff when I hear, you know, see someone bluffing. Are you serious? Like like, if I see the face with it, I'll go, that's not right. Or I just know the stock. I just know right, my stocks, right, you know? Right. And that has a lot to do with it. How many years have you been in Apple now? I forget. Uh, 07. Right, 2007. Wow. I bought an iPhone and bought a bunch of Apple stock. So. Wow. Look at this. This is crazy. Okay. Here, you've been in it since here. Yeah. Long time. Well, the dream target obviously is 200. I don't think that hits by 2015, but obviously if you don't need to take the profit on this, which you don't, then you just keep holding it. That's what, I mean, I will. I mean, occasionally I might, I mean, if I feel like it's going to pull back, sometimes I have, I've taken some profit and gone back in when it dropped just for fun, you know, okay. just because, you know. Well, that's good, that's good. Is there anything you think you want to tell any traders out there or anybody that's interested in the market or gaps or any kind of advice you can give because you're so experienced in the market? It really is all about discipline. You have really? to, when you, when you do this, the reason I miss trades mm -hmm. in the room with you is usually because I'm dealing with something at work with my, with my 
real job during the day. Right. My goal is to make this my real profession mm -hmm. and put my real estate on the side, mm -hmm. but I haven't flipped it yet. So um, focus, focus think, and learn. You have to study. This is, this is not, mm -hmm. this is not something that happens by accident. Okay. What you've done, what you've created is something that took more discipline than most people have <laughs> ever <you>. for anything. <laughs> I mean, the sac the financial sacrifice, the time sacrifice yeah. uh, that you've put out to do it, to know in the end it was going to win. Not many people have that in them. They really don't. Uh, thank you. That's nice. Um, I appreciate you know you sharing your knowledge with all of us too. Um, now, do you think there's any advantage, I'm going to say this to you, being a woman as a trader? Um, I think, I think I've, it's a little bit funny in the trading room because you never know who, who's what with the names. <laughs> so that's I true. have to say no. <laughs> I think that's my answer. I don't believe there's an advantage. Really? I believe your advantage in life is just how you handle yourself. Wow, oh my God, this is like Plato or something. I have to like write this down. This is so profound. No, I mean, I don't believe our sex determines our success or failure in life. That's uh, terrific. I'm giving you a round of applause. That's so great. The only thing that I've noticed though, and I'm obviously, I mean, you probably noticed this like when you were back on the exchange, there's so few women that trade the market and I have no idea why. I have absolutely no idea why. I mean, why? Why don't women want to do it? Well, because it was old boys school forever. It's coming around, but I know a lot of successful women from the day in the stock market. They just, there were few and far between, but the ones that were there made money. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's good. You know, back in the 80s, no. You didn't see a lot of women, but the ones that were there were successful. Because yeah. if they weren't, they wouldn't have been able to stay there. It was too expensive to be there. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So. I think women are coming into their own and realizing that they can achieve as much as men, if not more. And I think that, you know, men can, women, men can do it. Women can do it, just like you pointed out. But I encourage women to be successful because the beautiful thing about trading gaps, which as you know is the only strategy that I trade, is that you can trade in the morning and be done so quick. I mean, you could do your real estate job later in the day after you trade. The only problem is that you have not set that time for yourself and been so strategic about your timing. If you said to yourself, I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to get on the treadmill and then I'm going to take the dogs out and then I'm going to trade with Melissa till 10, 10, 15, 10, 30. And then I'm going to do the real estate stuff starting 11. You'd be on a schedule. It's just about making that schedule for yourself. Right. I just, I have too many people coming at me and I haven't really made that boundary, which I'm going to make it starting yeah. the, the end of this month. So. I mean, it's difficult to make boundaries with people when you've been involved with them for a long time. And as you know, if you have emotional relationships or attachments to people, it's difficult to make the boundaries. But when you are able to do that, you become more centered with yourself and all the stuff you do, the yoga, the meditation, you know how to do that. Oh, I totally know. Yeah. Well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight, Jen, and sharing everything with me. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, for you Melissa, coming. for inviting me. This is Melissa with the StockSwish.com. This is Jen, Trader Jen, former stockbroker and now professional day trader. So thanks so much for coming tonight and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. You too.